And thank you, Yoko, for all your hard work in preparing the test seminars this year. This year. Um, I'd like to start off with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land that we stand, the Uruganji and Jabukai, their, and their part, their past, present and future leaders. Um, so it's with great pleasure to, for our last lecture this year to introduce Nigel Tucker, Amanda Freeman and David Ting as our speakers. Um, I think we're privileged, we've got a lot of experience, oh, how many years? Over a hundred years of. <laughs> Why did I do that? <laughs> Over a hundred years. Last year, so you're asking <laughs> no, we've got a, like a fantastic knowledge on how rainforests recover in degraded landscapes. And Nigel, who's been working for a very long time in restoring rainforests, like did I say very? A long time in restoring <laughs> rainforests <laughs> um, in the tropic in tropics. Amanda Freeman, who um, is a tropical ecologist but works a lot with birds. I don't want to just I don't want to put you too much into the, into one area, mainly birds. And David Ting, who um, has worked with me, is. Um, Oh, he's a wonderful botanist, but he's also more of an ecophysiologist, I think, as well. <laughs> and today they're going to work on a pretty spectacular, they're going to discuss the recovery in a pretty spectacular site. It's um, Donaghy's Corridor on the Atherton Tableland, which I think might be one. It's certainly spectacular in many regards. It's one of the oldest restored wildlife corridors. Um, and I think what makes it really unique compared to what's been done in Central, in Central America, you see lots of wildlife corridors, but in those landscapes, they've only, they've only been deforested for very short periods of time. So the abandonment time is really short and there's a lot of seed rain and a lot of seeds bank and seedling bank. So what we've had to do, what they've done, what Nigel's done on the Atherton Tablelands has been very much having to build something from scratch. And I think that's what makes Donahue's Corridor really unique globally. And so without more to do, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, and you know, Susan has played no small part in this. Um, in fact, um, Susan and Bill were the ones who came to me and said, she'd probably go and have a talk to that farmer. Um, over there. So a lot of what you'll hear about today actually goes way back to um, back to the early 1980s, in fact. <clears throat> Similarly, I'd just like to quickly uh, acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, the Gumai Wallabari Yidinji, the Yiraganji, the Malambari Yidinji and the Nudjan people who are the traditional owners of the land that this study was conducted on. I'd also like to um, thank a lot of um, landholders and volunteers who've help to establish <clears throat> uh, this project, but especially um, to Tracy Marshall, Deborah Akbar, and Amanda James for their contributions to the study as well. So very quickly, I'm sure you're all aware that habitat loss, fragmentation, and isolation are major drivers of tropical extinctions across the planet. Um, increasing landscape connectivity potentially enhances uh, movement between fragments and obviously the dispersal of seeds, pollen and wildlife, um, as well as providing habitat per se. Um, the restoration of wildlife corridors obviously seeks to reinstate landscape connectivity as quickly as possible because there are obviously short and long-term threats. And I I'm, I'm, don't intend to, to go through them. I'm sure you all understand them as equally. Um, in terms of ecological restoration, you need to understand that um, Monitoring is rare. Baseline data is rare as rocking horse shit. These are very expensive things to do. Um, there are very few long-term studies that exist to show whether succession is predictable or not. And obviously there's a lot of debate about the whole concept of succession. <clears throat> and as my friend, um, Teen McDonald suggests, it's probably another victim of cancel culture. Today's seminar, though, focuses on 21 years of change in, well one, in one well-studied corridor, and uh, we'll briefly at the end out, outline the replication of this study at two other sites. 
And I should just mention that the current study is ongoing. Um, we've got another round of sampling to do uh, later this summer. Donaghy's Corridor um, is an 800 metre by 80 metre on average or 7.5 hectare link between Lake Berene, uh, 498 hectare isolate, and Wirrunurin, um, obviously which encompasses <clears throat> excuse me, Mount Bartle Freer and Mount Bellin and Kerr, 90% of the corridor crosses the family, um, the Donaghy family property. Uh, we did a lot of baseline data uh, before any treatment. We surveyed for, um, to determine what vegetation was present, also to determine um, the um, status of the small mammal community, which was pretty much done by Bill and Sue. But concomitant to that, uh, Nick Campbell, who was doing his PhD at the time, um, did a lot of genetic studies <clears throat> at Lake Berene and found that um, the Euromese population in particular at Lake Berene had lost a significant amount of genetic variability since the isolate, or since the patch was isolated. In our plant treatment, we detected 132 different trees, vines and shrubs, mostly in two 1.75 hectare patches of uh, original slash regrowth forest that was still on the creek. <clears throat> Over four years, between 95 and 98, we established 17,000 seedlings of about 100 reference ecosystem species or an average of 55 per year. And alongside that, we planted three rows of hoop pine um, for a variety of reasons, um, everything from reducing the effect of edge to uh, increasing the amount of shade available for cattle, because cattle show much better live weight gain and much better reproductive capacity when they have access to shade. Our plant selection was trait-based. We used around 30 or 40 framework species, plus threatened species, some large fruited species, which are quite immobile in degraded landscapes, and the food plants of some target vertebrates, which in this case were cassowaries and the arboreal foldables. So the picture on the left shows the creek in 1943. The picture on the right shows um, the corridor as it stands at the moment. You can see those three rows of Araucaria on either side of the corridor, but you can also see the level of degradation um, going back many, many decades. So very quickly, we um, established some vegetation transects across the corridor in 1998, immediately after the planting was completed, and we started to monitor some of the short-term outcomes um, from that. Within three years, we detected 115 new native species, or I should say 115 native species, that is uh, 4472 records from uh, 180 15 square metre plots. Those 115 species were drawn from 48 families, and 25 um, were sourced from outside the corridor and the immediate matrix. As I said, we surveyed the corridor and out to 50 metres from the corridor um, to look at what plants were there to start with. Gap phase species actually dominated. Um, they were the overwhelming majority of what we detected three years later. Um, plants in the 10 to 30 millimetre size class dominated the vegetation. Um, there was only seven seeds or fruits uh, larger than 30 millimetres diameter and uh, vertebrates accounted for 85 to 90% of the regeneration, mostly um, bird dispersal. So just um, that spot um, where you can see those volunteers planting um, is the spot where David's standing now. Um, so that, and that uh, Quandong that he's standing up against there is around 34 to 35 metres high. So in 2021, 20 years after um, the previous survey, we went back, we resampled those same transects. This time we picked up 153 as opposed to 115 in the previous 20. Um, instead of 48, we detected 59 families. And again, around 25 or 26 came from forests um, well and truly outside the corridor. Um, large fruited species increased from seven to 14. The regeneration contained all life forms um, from orchids through to canopy and subcanopy trees, vines, rattans, shrubs, ferns, many of. And you can see um, where David's standing, um, it's beginning to show um, a nice um, degree of complexity. 
So if we look at those changes in species diversity, first of all, can I draw your attention to the left hand, um, those uh, bars on the left hand side? They indicate the average number of species in the canopy per 15 square metres. So obviously, I don't have anything to compare to go back to because in 2000, the whole thing was just a three to five metre monotonic canopy of um, pioneers essentially with the um, other things underneath. But now we have um, on average 1.8 species per 15 square metres in that 20 to 35 millimetre um, height class. In the sub canopy, um, and I should just mention, I'm sorry, across the bottom you'll see the planting years. As I said, we planted in 95, 96, 97 and 98. So the second column shows the average number of species in the sub canopy. Third um, indicates the average number of species on the ground. Fourth, the number of species occurring in more than one strata. So they may have occurred on the ground as well as the sub canopy. Um, but I'll draw your attention in particular to the uh, column showing on the ground 2000. That was the um, diversity of species on the ground at age three. And on the far right hand side, the number of species that are actually shared um, between now and going back to 20 years ago. Some really brief kind of ecological stuff. Um, Lauraceae 17 species and Sapindaceae 13 were the most common families. They're obviously characteristic families in relatively well-developed forest, but there were other basal lineages present in addition to those two. We detected 14 exotic species, mostly pasture grasses and herbs on the edge of the corridor, but we also detected um, Cidium cattleyanum and Cinnamomum camphora in a couple of transects. The fruit size distributions remain relatively constant over the last 20 years. Um, that 10 to 30 millimetre size class is dominant. Again, birds are responsible for the vast majority of what's come up, but um, mammals are also playing their part, the remainder by wind or water. And all of these images that you're seeing on the right hand side are images from within the corridor of vegetation. Just quickly, um, up the top there, Balchmedia, Bancroftii and Gardenia ovularis are quite large seeds. Um, they've come into the corridor. We don't know where they've come from because the nearest tree is obviously 50 to 100 metres away at least. Balchmedia, Turam and Indiandra sankiana, we've picked them up in um, transects. They've been dispersed uh, internally by either birds or mammals and the distances are around one to 200 metres from the parent tree. In the case of Endiandra and Cygnus, this is something which weighs, uh, you know, about the same as what I'd use for butter in a pastry recipe, 150 grams. So that's been moved. We know the, where the tree lays. We know where the two that have regenerated lay, and they're a distance of two to 400 metres at least. So something has obviously moved a really large seed a considerable distance, and I think the only animal that could have done it is probably a white-tailed rat. And the scatter hoarding behaviour that I've seen elsewhere in the corridor suggests that it's almost certainly a white tail. David, would you like to come and um, talk to us about structure and composition? Thanks, Nigel. Uh, so getting to this point, I thought uh, we thought that It'd be nice to have something to compare it to. So to compare the corridor plots uh, transects with some rain, some primary rainforest transects, and ask a few questions, simple questions like um, to do with species diversity, whether the corridor plots are uh, different from rainforest plots in terms of their species diversity and composition, and obviously also the structure because. Uh, It'd be nice to have some kind of quantitative data to back up what we are seeing in terms of the structural recovery of the corridor sites. So <clears throat> uh, we just came up with a very simple sampling scheme. Uh, most of this we are using, so Nigel mentioned this just now that he had 12 transacts in the corridor site. So we are subsampling from within these 12 transacts, a 50 by three meter uh, belt transact in which we would measure the diameters, the stem diameters and the heights of 
all trees, all, all stems above one centimeter. Uh, ID everything to species. And would, on those spots inside the transect there is where we would take some uh, canopy cover estimates. And in, we would do uh, even smaller stems within a subplot of uh, 15 meters square inside the plots. And you can see we, we might use different size, uh, different types of plot depending on the configuration of the site so that we can avoid edge effects. Uh, yeah, but they will come up to 150 square meters each. Uh, yeah. And at the moment we have managed to, at the moment we have managed to do about three rainforest sites and just one transect in, in, uh, in the corridor where we got all the stems. Uh, so the first thing we do is uh, have a look at how uh, species are accumulating across an, you know, the number of individual samples. So this is a species abundance curve, if you will. And you can see that, uh, well, hopefully our rainforest is, the, the, the sampling regime of our rainforest is sufficient enough to capture a good amount of the diversity. We can still do more. And I, ideally I would like to have uh, five to six transacts so that this, uh, this curve comes up to, uh, starts to level out a bit. And uh, yeah, I cringe at being at showing you that one corridor transact, but yeah, we'll get there. And so these are just some of the, some of the numbers that we have so far. Uh, the rainforest reference sites, we presented the average and the range of species richness and uh, two other species diversity indices, because species richness is just the number of uh, species you find the belt transect, but those other indices give you, uh, take into account the abundance of some other species, uh, some of the species in, in the transect. Uh, at the moment, what you can see is that uh, we are getting kind of the range of uh, the corridor transects kind of fall within the range of the of the rainforest transects, so uh, but that might change once we get more more transactions. So, but let's see. And at the bottom, that table at the bottom, we're just presenting the. Uh, this is based on all of twelve, all of Nigel's twelve transacts in the corridors. Uh, you can see that it's got about one hundred and ninety-one species, and uh, the rainforest reference site has about one hundred and forty. Uh, and again, uh, after we sample about five or six rainforest reference sites, I think that number of 140 will increase as well. And we did an ordination. I mean, so species diversity is one thing, but species composition is another thing altogether. So yeah, if we asking the question of whether species composition is getting close to rainforest, the answer would have to be uh, nowhere close. And I don't think that's going to change even after sampling, sampling more rainforest sites, we'll, we would have uh, pretty much the same result. So what you can see is uh, when we plot the composition in two dimensions, all the corridor plots in, in yellow uh, cluster at one end of the ordination and the rainforest sites cluster at the another end. And they are mostly being, this ordination is mostly being driven by a number of species and on those on the corridor side, uh, we're still getting quite a fair bit of some of these species that are more associated with uh, sex, early successional sort of environments. And, uh, and on, for the rainforest, you get some really old growth sort of things. Uh, like Agyrodendron is a red tulip oak, I think is that what it's called, common name. And it's uh, one of the mature phase uh, rainforest trees you get in in the region. So yeah, you know, I'm wanting to fill out those gaps there. But so uh, and the last question is how does uh, forest structure compare? So just uh, as I said, we took we measured stems above one centimeters from from uh, all the transects, and this uh, yeah this is uh, this is some of the structure parameters. Uh, and again, you're seeing, you, you, you would find that the things in the rainforest reference and 
the corridor transacts are somewhat the same. I mean, there's a little, the basal area of the corridor size is a bit lower, but with just one transact, I mean, I can't give you any, I can't give you any p-values at the moment. But the interesting thing was the canopy cover was uh, higher in the, the canopy cover was higher in the uh, revegetated corridor transact. And uh, you, you'll see why later. And that's just, and the, the, the graph on the left side, on your right, my left, is uh, just a breakdown of the size class distribution of the stems. And yeah, relatively similar, although there's just a bit more stems of the smaller size class in, in, uh, in the corridor transect. Yeah, but you know, these, these, these figures and numbers here are probably as interesting to me as they are as mean, meaningless to you. So uh, yeah, I think, I think a better way to look at this would be to, to, to have it, to be able to see it in profile. And so we just, uh, we decided to, to re resurrect an old technique in forestry, which is to do a profile diagram. So on those uh, 50 meter long transacts, we not only measured for one of them at least in, in, in the rainforest and one of them in the, cor uh, in the Donald Geese corridor transact, we measured the crown diameters and the height to the first uh, branch as well. And that allows us to plot out how the trees look like in profile. So in this, in this uh, old growth rainforest transact that we, measured, that we did in Lake Berrien, you can see it has all the features of a really complex forest. It's got, it's got many structural layers. It's got the, the canopy layer, sub canopy layer and, and understory shrubs and trees. Uh, you can see it's got robust lianas. It's got complexity in the, in the root systems as well. It's got all those uh, plank roots over there. So that's uh, as paradisical as gets. And then that's where you go in there and hug some trees. If you notice that little man over there, that's me. Anyway, so if we could, if we could see, if we could compare a second, the, the revegetated forest with this, it might give you a better idea of how, how well the success, uh, the regeneration has taken place. So this is the cor the, cor the transect that we did in the corridor. Those trees in blue, are the original trees that were planted 25, 26 years ago. So there are, sorry, I don't know why that didn't come up, but there are, 100 and, there are 117, 16 stems in this one, and there were 78 stems in this one, above one centimeter diameter. This one had 100 and some, 116 stems. And you can see as well, we are getting a fair bit of structural development. You have a nice uh, canopy layer and sub canopy development. And you can see how dense the undergrowth is and that's why the uh, canopy cover was a bit higher. Uh, yeah, it's also a good place to go hugging trees. Yeah, uh, so that's all I have. I don't think I, I don't think I missed anything. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Oh yes, yeah. And so just to summarize those results, yeah. Uh, species diversity, diversity is, they're kind of comparable with the rainforest uh, site. Species composition, we're nowhere close. Uh, I don't know when we'll ever be close, but uh, the corridor has uh, some lower basal area, but higher stem number. And the stratification is more or less getting there with rainforest. Um, yeah, I'll leave it back to- Thank you, David. <laughs> So if we look at the um, small mammal assemblages in 2000, um, this is from a mark recapture as well as, as a genetic study. We, um, we recorded 13 specialists and generalists, mostly partitioned by habitat preference. Those non-forest species, um, particularly things like uh, Rattus uh, latriolus, Rattus sorditus, Mus musculus, Melamis burtoni, they uh, become absent after three years. And our genetic studies um, showed that um, we had actually been able to induce um, an F1 hybrid in the Rattus fuscovies population after three years. So those, uh, just very quickly, um, if we 
look at these across the column. O ON and OS, they are both uh, tr um, transects or trapping plots that were put in the pasture next to the corridor, just to see if there was anything actually using the pasture. And as you can see, it was totally dominated by grassland species. Those next two columns, B, C, B, E, that's the Barine core site. So we had a site deep in the forest at Lake Barine. We also had a site on the edge at Lake Barine. Um, and obviously that's mostly dominated by rainforest species. The four corridor transects and that little remnant of forest that was left in the middle of the corridor, again, um, mostly rainforest species. Um, and the far, to, the far right columns, GCGE, they're the Gadgara edge and Gadgara core plantings. You'll see that things like the Antichinus, um, Hipsy primidon, we only ever trapped them in a well-developed forest. They were never found within the corridor itself. Um, and most interesting, as I said, was the fact that um, the Rattus fuscopes population, uh, there was a, an easily detectable genetic difference between the Barine population and the Gadgara population. And that enabled us to be able to document that F1 hybrid in the center of the corridor, in fact, in the third year of the study. We went back um, this year and put out some remote cameras. We baited them with chicken necks. We put them out in the wet and dry season, um, two on each, two in each section of the corridor, as well as the remnant, but we did no live trapping. We recorded exactly the same closed forest species apart from Antichinus flavopes, but we detected no uh, grassland species at all. Unfortunately, no, still no closed forest uh, specialists, no um, Antichinus, no Hipsy um, none of those kind of things. However, we did for the first time um, detect water rats. They certainly weren't there when we started. Um, we've also picked up an echidna at both ends of the corridor. Um, and um, we also got um, a couple of exotics, as you'll see, uh, feral cats feral pigs, they like to hang out in these areas as well. Um, we actually got eight birds, um, got their picture taken, and a, a black snake, curiously attracted to a chicken neck. So the other really exciting thing that, well, judge it for yourself, I guess. Um, this was our, the first time we'd actually put uh, anabats um, in a corridor, first time we've actually put Anabats in any kind of restored forest. So these records um, were really quite surprising to us because they were just totally unexpected. Um, we put out uh, detectors in each yearly planting and in the adjacent pasture in March and August uh, for four nights. We detected eight species uh, most in, in the corridor. They're mostly clutter adapted, um, but we also detected them in open areas. I would also just mention that the, the count numbers for calls um, were 80 to 90% higher in the corridor than they were in the open areas. We've got some really nice records there. Obviously, probably the one that I was most excited about was Hippocideris, which generally isn't um, found outside well-developed forest. Um, Myotis macropus is obviously just using the creek and it's um, on all parts of the creek, utilising, um, that's obviously one that, that fishes. Um, but probably the one that, that most excited me was um, Sacolamus, um, mostly because it's um, an ex extreme, extremely unusual to see that species inland, it's generally coastal, but of course it's also uh, classified as endangered. Um, Cherifron ostronomus and the other Minioptus were only ever sorry, were only recorded in the pasture, but they also um, do forage and roost in forested areas. Um, the um, the Vespadilis, um is also another fairly interesting record because they have fairly small territory sizes and that would tend to suggest um, that it's actually living somewhere in the corridor. Amanda, would you like to talk us through birds? Amanda Freeman. Oops, it's gone too far. Ah. Oh. 
Here we go. Good eye. Thank you. All right. Oh. It's touchy. Don't move. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, as Sue said earlier, yes, I have been involved in ecology on the tablelands for quite some time, and particularly birds. Uh, I have been interested in bird communities in revegetation sites uh, for just over 20 years or so. Um, sparked initially by going to one of these last plantings at uh, Donaghy's Corridor uh, when I first arrived in Australia in 1997. Yes, a while ago. Um, but my interest in this is really twofold. First of all, uh, many of you will be aware that the work of um, Stephen Williams here at JCU and his colleagues have found that a lot of our rainforest species across the wet tropics, uh, the populations have declined over that 20 year period, um, and almost certainly due to climate change. And if we look at our wet tropics endemic rainforest bird species, their populations have declined even more, um, as much as 34%. So I'm very interested in whether revegetated areas can provide us with more, or provide the birds, more to the point, with uh, more habitat um, to sort of try and buffer those, those bird populations. Whether it can provide more habitat and whether perhaps it can provide conduits for movement for these species so they can keep moving around our wet tropics landscapes. So that's the first reason that I'm interested in revegetation. Can it provide habitat for birds which are becoming threatened? Uh, secondly, of course, as Nigel already spoke about, uh, birds are very important dispersers of rainforest fruits. Uh, so it's birds which are dispersing a lot of the uh, seed, which is helping to regenerate uh, these areas past the planting. Um, you know, we can plant a certain amount of species, but it's really the, the birds particularly that are gonna do the heavy lifting of, of all the future regeneration. Okay, so that's why I'm interested in these things. Yeah. Except I can't work the PowerPoint. Okay, so what do we know about birds in revegetation sites? How do the communities change uh, through time? And I'm gonna talk you through some examples here uh, from Peterson Creek, which is one of the other corridors which we hope to um, bring into the study. Uh, I'm familiar with Peterson Creek because I have uh, studied the bird community development there over the first sort of few years um, of that corridor being established. Um, but although this is a Peterson Creek example, uh, it also applies to uh, revegetation across the tablelands. I'm talking particularly about the Atherton tablelands here um, because we have had, I was previously part of a, a METSURF study where we looked at a large chrono sequence of sites. So we were looking at uh, different ages of revegetation uh, and the bird communities in them. So this is a composite of data uh, from, from um, both those studies. So first of all, if we look over on the left, okay, this is a newly planted site um, at Peterson Creek. Uh, and when you, when the, that site is first being established, um, inevitably you get a range of ground foraging and grassland bird species, as you might sort of expect. Then as time goes on and you move towards getting a, a closed but low canopy uh, in the middle there um, at about sort of three years or so post planting, uh, you start to get some of your common mixed forest species. Uh, on the tablelands, that would be a thing like a, a Lewin's honey eater, say, pictured there. Um, and they tend to be the species that have got, you know, wider habitat preferences, mixed forest species might be found in both eucalypt forest and, and rainforest, say. Then we find that about the 10 year mark, it reaches a sort of threshold where you get um, your grassland species dropping out, just like Nigel was saying with the uh, small mammals, those grassland species are no longer there. It's the same for the birds. Um, and by about 10 years, we find that 50% or so of our 
rainforest specialised birds, birds which are depend, bird species which are dependent on rainforest um, are already colonising those um, restoration sites, which is quite good news. Ooh, really finicky. I need a light touch. Okay, so that's sort of what happens up to about 10 years. Then we haven't got too much information about what happens in the bird communities after that. One of those reasons is that we don't have a lot of revegetation sites which are at that age yet. Um, Donaghy's Corridor is an example where they are, those revegetation sites are getting into their, um, well, into their third decade now, okay? Uh, so I'm interested in what happens as, as, the, as they age, do we sort of reach a peak of, you know, rainforest species and that's as good as it's going to get? Or does it go on, you know, improving um, and becoming more rainforest-like through time? So Donaghy's is a good opportunity uh, to look at that. Um, there have been two previous studies uh, of the birds in Donaghy's Corridor. Uh, the first was really a foundation study for looking at birds in, in rainforest revegetation done by Amy Jensen, um, back when those sites were really still young, you know. Uh, she completed her studies between 1996 and 1998, so those plantings were really new. Um, and as we might expect, at that time, Amy found uh, no rainforest specialist species. Um, she did find 10 species which, you know, mainly use rainforest, but, but not, the, not the, the real specialists. Um, back in 2008, I surveyed one site uh, at Donaghy's Corridor, the 1990, um, it was a transect in the 1997-1998 age, uh, and that was part of that whole chrono sequence of sites that we surveyed for the NetSurf project. Uh, and in that one uh, transect at Donaghy's uh, in 2008, I found uh, just nine rainforest species. So, so not, a, not a great heap. Over on the right here, uh, we have uh, a map. Uh, the, the, the circles are Amy Jensen's um, study sites. And I should point out that I'm using quite different methods from Amy. Um, Amy did point transects. Um, which is a perfectly good method. Um, but because the uh, MetSurf study uh, was done with 100 metre transects, um, I'm repeating that so that it's more comparable uh, across, across the table lands. So what's uh, superimposed here with the red lines uh, is my transects um, for 2001. Uh, so you can see that they're in the same locations uh, as Amy's point um, counts, uh, but, but using a different method. So with this method, um, it's um, a method that we've sort of established for rainforest monitoring in the wet tropics, uh, sorry, bird monitoring in the wet tropics and revegetation sites. Uh, we wrote up a chapter on this in the monitoring revegetation sites toolkit. Uh, and it's a 100 metre transect, uh, 30 metres wide, um, where you can get it in a revegetation site, which might not be very wide, so uh, we do our best. Uh, and it's everything that you see and hear along that transect in a 30 minute period of time. So it's, a, it's a, both an area and a time sample method. Okay, so what have we found? Uh, so remember, Amy Jensen had no rainforest dependent birds. Uh, I had nine back in 2008. Um, this is uh, the status as it, as it now, um, having done four rounds of transects. There'll be another two done uh, later in the year. Um, so I think Nigel, Nigel talked earlier. No, no, sorry, David was saying earlier, you know, diversity is one thing. Um, uh, composition is quite another. Uh, so what I'm interested in is 
not just how many species we've got. I mean, that's interesting. And as it is, we've got 31 odd bird species using the corridor. But, but what are those birds? What are those species? So this is a chart of um, birds allocated into their functional habitat groups or their habitat preferences. Um, the GW is grassland and wetland birds. Uh, EF is eucalypt forest. MF is mixed forest, so those generalist species that don't mind what sort of forest cover they've got. Um, and RF is, is your rainforest dependent birds. Um, I've fudged things a little bit here and given you an example of a composition of bird communities in a paddock. Um, that was a site close to Lake Boreen that was used for the MetServe study. And as you can see, as you'd expect, you know, over on the left hand side, you've got a predominance of grassland um, and wetland species, but we would have been grassland species at that stage. And very few of the other things, you know, you might get the odd rainforest species over on the right of the paddock uh, group, you know, that might be a, a honey eater passing through using a bit of lantana or something like that. Then over on the far right, uh, we've got the composition of the Lake Bar the bird species composition in the Lake Barine Forest, um, sampled this year, 2000, uh, 2021. Uh, and as you can see, most of the bird species there are rainforest dependent species, and you've got a, a certain proportion of mixed forest species as well. Um, and then in the middle, we've got the three uh, transects that I've got at Lake Barine. Um, and as you can see, except for a few eucalypt forest species still using the 97-98 um, transect, uh, the other sites you know, are, are dominated by, by rainforest dependent species and a similar sort of composition of rainforest and mixed forest species as, as Lake Boreen. So it's really getting rainforest-like as far as the birds are concerned. And I suppose, you know, unlike the ground mammals that Nigel was talking about, the birds, of course, can fly, as can the microbats that Nigel was talking about, which are also sort of getting a bit more like um, closed forest um, community. Can I, I just need a lighter touch. Chubby fingers. Okay. So it's getting more like a rainforest community, rainforest bird community. What can we say about those species of special interest? Okay, so I, I went through looking at uh, all the species which um, Williams and colleagues identified as declining at those mid-elevational levels that, that um, Donaghy's corridor is at. Um, and we've got 13 of those species that they've recorded as declining um, occurring in Donaghy's corridor. So that's exciting. It means it's providing habitat for birds which are, you know, facing some challenges. Um, and amongst the endemics, I've been really excited to find grey-headed robin, pied monarch, even a toothbill bowbird, bird, and Victoria's rifle bird utilising uh, the revegetation site. So that's also quite exciting. Um, some of the endemics are conspicuous by their absence. We haven't had chow chillers recorded yet, for instance. So um, they're one of our more, you know, recalcitrant species. They, then, you know, I don't know whether they're going to come into a revegetation site anytime soon. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, the, the one side of things. Is it doing something for these birds threatened by climate change? Yes. Um, and I must admit, I've been a little bit pleasantly surprised by that because I was fearful that these sites might get to a certain stage and not get any further. So I'm thrilled to see that there is some more progress. On the other side of things, um, are these, um, you know, they're providing habitat for birds, but are birds there doing the job of helping the forest regenerate? Yes, they are. Uh, we've identified um, six, you know, um, obligate frugivores there, channel bill cuckoo, wampu fruit doves, bird fruit doves. Some of these are um, closed forest specialists. Um, so it's been really, really pleasant to see them there, um, fig bird, cat bird, and so forth. And some of these, uh, like the channel bill cuckoo, um, you know, they have a pretty large gape size, so they can swallow some of those, um, you know, 
not the big, big seeds that Nigel was talking about, but the 30, 35 millimeter sort of wide seeds that they can they can swallow and disperse. So there we go. Uh, this must be you. Thank Thanks, you. Amanda. <clears throat> it's hard not to get enthusiastic about things when Amanda gives you data like that. Um, so just to summarise, um, vegetation structural complexity, species diversity, they're both increasing. They're moving towards our reference ecosystem, but there are obviously huge differences in structure and composition. Terrestrial mammals are relatively unchanged. I think um, there's good evidence there that scatter hoarding by rodents is probably an underestimated dispersal service. Uh, the microbat use, as I mentioned, includes that really rare inland record of Saccholomus saccholomus. The bird assemblages, as we've just heard us, are obviously moving towards the reference ecosystem. And in terms of the small mammals, we've been able to demonstrate both movement and colonisation. But um, as, as I point out to many, this is one corridor in one location. Um, so what we've decided to do, Amanda, David and myself, is expand this out to a three corridor study um, where um, totally aware that replication really stymies our understanding of this. And as well, it, it really constrains us being able to talk about validity. So comparing and contrasting other restored corridors could better inform wildlife management strategies in other landscapes. Corridors, as I mentioned, are, are expensive to establish, even more horribly expensive to monitor, and real world landscapes make um, absolute replication difficult. But there are three corridors that were, that were established between 1995 and 2015. They're all within an 8.5K radius of each other, embedded in a fairly similar agricultural matrix. Each of these corridors used um, solely native species and establishment generally followed the same um, kind of established restoration practice. The Lakes Corridor, um, I'll show you a map in a, in a moment, uh, was established in the late 1990s. Um, sorry, that should be the early 1990s. Oh, uh, no, sorry, the late 1990s. Um, it's around 1.3 k's long. It combines some natural as well as some um, restored forest, um, natural regeneration, sorry. It has continuous canopy cover and it uh, crosses properties owned by two uh, different landowners. Um, it has wide entry points with a narrow midpoint and one minor road crossing. In comparison, Peterson Creek is 4.3 kilometres long. It's much, much longer. It was established over a longer period. Canopy cover is not yet continuous um, and there are about 10 landowners. It's a narrow linear planting with one major road crossing and one minor road crossing. So if you have a look at the map, you can see Donaghy's Corridor in the top right, the Lakes Corridor in the centre, and down on the bottom left, linking Curtin Fig National Park to Lake Eacham is Peterson Creek. And you can see it's a much more tenuous kettle of fish. But Donaghy's has informed our project design. Uh, we plan to document vegetation, composition and structure. Uh, birds and terrestrial mammals, um, as well as bats, and compare them with uh, intact forest replicates. We do have design and implementation issues. Um, Donaghy's Corridor, we had a bucket load of uh, baseline data. We were very careful about um, checking everything that was living there before we did anything. We have less of that available for Peterson Creek and the Lakes Corridor, but having said that, these were blank pasture slates, so we're relatively confident that there was um, bugger all of any, um, of any importance in that area. There are some um, spatial and, and matrix differences, obviously, in terms of Peterson Creek. Logistics is um, going to be an issue, um, but we've got uh, lots of stakeholders who are prepared to participate. We plan to study, as I said, vegetation, birds, terrestrial mammals and bats. We're trying to get some interest in doing some arboreal mammal sampling, which is obviously one of our main target groups, given the, the precarious nature 
of uh, so many arboreal mammals on the Atherton Tablelands. We're also interested in uh, reptiles, either using pitfall traps, ground observation, uh, cameras, etc. We're hoping to get uh, funding from a Nature Refuge Landholders Grant Program, which opens in a couple of weeks' time. Um, just as a bit of a bait to throw out there, we're hoping to get some sufficient funds for some student stipends. And all aspects of the project are potentially student projects. So uh, for any student supervisors, et cetera, out there who'd be interested in taking part in that study, we'd love to hear from you.